Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to U.S. History Through Film, as we look at some important events taking place during the time of and right after the end of the movie Glory. Now, um, after the great defeat of the Union Army at Fredericksburg, General Burnside was replaced by Fighting Joe Hooker. Um, and he was under a lot of pressure to accomplish something uh, in early 1863. And so he did what Burnside should have done in December of 1862, and simply moved up the Rappahannock River a bit, crossed the river where it was shallow, and moved into Virginia. Although he left a large part of his army behind right across the river um, from Fredericksburg, hoping Lee would have to stay there to defend from a possible attack. Lee did leave some men behind, but though it was risky, he split his army and took most of them west to try to catch Joseph Hooker, which he did at a place called Chancellorsville. Now, let's suggest that this was actually a village or a town or something. Um, in fact, it was just an important crossroads in the woods um, on land belonging to the Chancellor family. Chancellorsville, such as it is, was a medium-sized mansion and the different outbuildings around it. Um, but here, um, in Robert E. Lee, um, encountered J Joseph Hooker on uh, May 2nd and 3rd, 1863. And here, um, Lee took another risk. He, his army was smaller than Hooker's to begin with, and he'd left some of it behind in Fredericksburg to guard against the bit of the army Hooker had left um, across the river from it. Here, facing an army still much larger than his own, Lee risked it by splitting it in half again, sending half of his army under the command of General Stonewall Jackson to march on some roads shown them by local people through the woods south of the Chancellor House hoping to get completely around Hooker's men um, and attack from the other side, which, um, which Jackson managed to pull off. So as Lee attacked Hooker's men from one side, and they're all facing towards the east to try to deal with Lee's forces, Jackson's men then stormed out of the forest, attacking them from the west. Um, Stonewall Jackson uh, caught Hooker's men off guard, Hooker was apparently stunned through the whole battle. A cannonball at one point hit the porch near where he was standing, and apparently he went into some sort of shock and would hardly give orders for most of the battle. Um, but it had taken Jackson a long time to march through the woods. They didn't completely defeat Hooker's forces um, on the first day of the battle. So when night fell, Stonewall Jackson and a few of his staff rode out to kind of scout the enemy positions, and, um, and planned for the next day. But as they rode back in the darkness, they weren't recognized by their own men. Confederate sentries fired on Stonewall Jackson, um, and he was hit three times by his own men and had to have his left arm amputated, which is buried at the Chancellorsville Battlefield. If you ever visit the National Park there, you can visit the grave of Stonewall Jackson's left arm, where it's a tradition to leave a lemon because he liked lemons. Um, and he had to go home to recover. Um, General Lee, um, knowing of Jackson's uh, loss, said he has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. Jackson being the general he relied on most, um, and he really did lose him. About a week later, um, Jackson died of pneumonia, um, which he probably would have survived otherwise. The next day, um, there was a little bit of fighting, and Hooker pulled back um, into Maryland. And so he was fired too. Lincoln going through generals um, at a pretty rapid clip, and replaced him with George Meade, who would command officially the Army of the Potomac for the rest of the war, um, although later on the commanding general of the entire U.S. Army would always ride with Meade and pretty much overrule anything he might say, which is not entirely fair to me, but maybe not entirely unfair either. Now, after the big victories at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, and Chancellorsville is often considered Lee's um, most tactically brilliant victory, the one which his movements on the battlefield um, were the most brilliant, the most risky, um, the risks to pay off. After these big victories, he decided he might have the chance to do what he had hoped to do the summer before when he invaded Maryland, to invade the North and win a big victory. Um, it might force the North to negotiate and possibly even get around behind Washington, D.C. and force a Northern surrender. And so he planned an invasion of Pennsylvania, uh, marching north um, in June of 1863. 
again hoping to maybe even um, threaten Washington, D.C. itself. But this didn't go real well for Lee. Um, he'd given his men orders to avoid conflict if possible. He wanted to find just the right point, ideally bet between the U.S. Army and Washington, D.C., and force the Union Army to attack him somewhere he could defend. But in Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania, all of his corps commanders, the top-ranking generals right below him, would let him down, including Jeb Stuart, the commander of his cavalry, who was supposed to be doing all the scouting, but ended up scouting out so far ahead of Lee's army, he wasn't able to get information back to him. So Lee's army was traveling practically blind. And so, largely by accident, some of Lee's men ran into some Union men at the little Pennsylvania town of Gettysburg. Um, they began to fight what could have been a pretty small-scale skirmish, um, but as both armies began to, uh, to join up there at Gettysburg, Lee, who had wanted to pick a place to fight, decided he would go ahead and fight here, although it wasn't a particularly good spot. The U.S. Army managing to get hold of a line of, ridge, of a ridge and, and hills um, across a big open field just south of Gettysburg. Um, and Lee, they said, had his blood up and was going to fight. Uh, and fighting did begin, I've already mentioned, July 1st, 1863. Um, and over the three days this battle would last, July 1st through the 3rd, 1863, the U.S. Army had about 83,000 men, the Confederates about 75,000. Although both sides arrived a few units at a time, straggling in over the 1st and 2nd of July. Had either side had a better idea where all the other side's men were, they might have been able to pick them off, one regiment or division at a time, Then neither side really knew what the other was up to. As I've already mentioned, all of Lee's core commanders um, failed to follow his orders properly. Um, and there's a lot that can be said about the details of the battle, but repeatedly, um, his generals did not attack when they were supposed to or where they were supposed to. On both the second and third days of the battle, different corps were supposed to attack at the same time um, to keep the Union Army from concentrating its forces, but um, on both days they did it. And had they done so, Lee might have won the battle and possibly won the war. But in due to his subordinates not carrying his orders out properly, and need to Lee fighting a battle somewhere he probably shouldn't have, um, the South lost this with a great loss of life. Now, on July 4th, 1863, the Army of Northern Virginia began to retreat back to the South, um, trailing behind a 17-mile-long wagon train full of supplies and loaded men. Wounded men, pardon me. Um, some may have been loaded to the painkillers or whatever else they had. And his army would never leave Virginia again. In total, 51,000 men, taking North and South together, because they are all Americans, um, were killed or wounded at Gettysburg, the largest battle ever fought in North America. Um, and... Um, Furthermore, on July 4th, the same day the U.S. Army, um, or the Confederate Army, pulled out of Gettysburg, Ulysses S. Grant, um, fighting in Mississippi, seized the town of Vicksburg, Mississippi, the last Confederate stronghold still on the Mississippi River, giving the North complete control of the Mississippi, cutting the South in half. Vicksburg's surrender on July 4th, 1863, would be so demoralizing at least in Vicksburg, they would not celebrate the 4th of July again until World War II, uh, about 80 years later. And um, just a few days later, um, the first and second battles of Fort Wagner, the second battle of Fort Wagner being what we saw in the movie Glory, uh, were fought July 11th and July 18th, 1863. But as we know, um, they did not succeed in capturing Fort Wagner in either of those attacks, and therefore did not take Charleston, at least yet. However, while the movie says that, Charles, that Fort Wagner was never captured, that's not entirely true. 
The U.S. Navy was blockading Charleston Harbor, bombarding the forts around the city and the city itself. And they finally bombarded Fort Wagner um, so heavily that Fort Wagner was abandoned September 7, 1863. Um, U.S. Navy continued to bombard Charleston. They destroyed Fort Sumter and other forts. So at Charleston, once one of the South's major ports, was cut off from any sea travel um, and badly damaged. Although the Confederates did have an interesting attempt to break this blockade as they developed one of the world's earliest submarines, named H.L. Hunt, after the submarine's inventor. Um, not the very first submarine ever built, or even the first that would be attempted to be used in warfare, as during the Revolutionary War. And during the Revolutionary War, a one-man submarine with a drill attached had sailed under British ships in the harbor and tried to drill a hole in the bottom of those British ships to sink them, not realizing the British plated the bottoms of their ships with copper, um, which they couldn't drill through. But the Hunley would be one of the first submarines to be used in warfare. First launched in 1863, the Hunley went out on a practice mission and sank, killing the whole crew. They managed to pull the Hunley up, went out on another practice mission, when the Hunley sank, killing the entire crew, including H.L. Hunley himself. So, with two practice missions, they pulled the Hunley back up, and set off for combat. Um, the Hunley had a torpedo. What they meant by torpedo at the time was basically a big bomb, um, which they had tied to a long pole on the front of the Hunley, which, on February 17, 1864, the Hunley rammed into the USS Housatonic, a U.S. Navy sloop blockading Charleston. It blew a big hole in the Housatonic and sank the Housatonic, but it also sank the Hunley again. Um, and this time the Hunley sank in deep water and was not found again until 1995, but today has been restored and is in a museum in Charleston. Charleston was not actually captured until February 18, 1865, and the first soldiers to enter the city were members of the 21st Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Colored Troops and the 55th Massachusetts Infantry, um, another black unit.